Welcome to The Savvy Sauce, where we have practical chats for intentional living. I'm your host, Laura Duggar, and I'm so glad you're here. Today's message is not intended for little ears. We'll be discussing some adult themes, and I want you to be aware before you listen to this message. I am thrilled to introduce you to our sponsor, Windshape Marriage. Their weekend retreats will strengthen your marriage, and you will enjoy this gorgeous setting, delicious food, and quality time with your spouse. To find out more, visit them online at windshapemarriage.org. That's W-I-N-S-H-A-P-E marriage.org. Thanks for your sponsorship. I heard an incredible story over a decade ago, and it has always stuck with me. Then recently, I came across Proverbs 17.9, and I couldn't get that story out of my head. Proverbs 17.9 says, He who covers over an offense promotes love, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. This scripture always reminds me of Bob and Audrey Meisner. So after I closed my Bible that day, I emailed them and requested they would be guests on this episode, and they said yes. So here we are. I hope your faith is expanded after hearing this redemptive story. Here's our chat. Welcome to the Savvy Sauce, Bob and Audrey. Oh my gosh, we have been so excited about this. I love the title of your podcast. I just think it's so unique. And fun, and I'm always about the fun. Yeah, this the time that we'll spend together, I believe, will be extremely meaningful and beneficial to the listener. Mm-hmm. We're honored to be here, Laura. Well, I'm so thrilled to have both of you. I've admired you from afar. Oh, wow. I love that. Well, we're family together. I love to say that we're not just like family we, because we are family. Yeah. We really all share such mutual belief in knowing that Jesus is amazing, Mm. you know, and so we get to share that together. Absolutely. And I'm so excited for people to hear your story. So let's just begin Uh with you two taking us back to how you first met each other. We started with a friendship. Bob was my brother's roommate, my big brother's roommate. It was a friendship, but I remember the moment we started sharing hearts with each other. I remember Mm -hmm. we would have these conversations like he, I, there's something about me. There's is not friends anymore. Mm-hmm. And we got to get out of the friend zone. And so it took a while. I had to, you know, drop some pretty stark hints. We started dating for a couple months. Yeah, yeah a couple months. And then we got engaged right away. We got engaged that summer. Mm-hmm. And then we lived apart for a year. She went back to school. I went uh, home to my home state, Michigan. And we spent, you know, basically a year apart. Engaged. And then mm-hmm. engaged. And then that next summer we were married. Yeah. And we So it was pretty quick. And we've been in ministry our entire lives. We immediately started working together for my parents' ministry in Canada. And it was just very natural for us to love people. I think that, you know, we were very attracted to each other. Like we just wanted to get married now. Mm. You know how that is once you know. And so we spent that year apart. We just dove into full-time ministry and just loved life. What we really enjoyed about each other, you know, from the very beginning is that, you know, we love the Lord. We wanted to be world changers. Mm -hmm. We believed that the two of us together, we would be able to do something that we couldn't do apart from each other. And I think that's one of the beauties, you know, of marriage, you know, where the two really come together and create a unified vision. And honestly, we are better together than we are apart. Mm-hmm. And so we got married and we just, I even remember on our honeymoon, Laura, mm. that I looked at, like, was we, we were young, we were 19 and 21, but I looked at Bob and I said, you know what? We could like have kids we and no one can, kids. no one could stop us. Like, no, we're adults. No one can tell us what we can't do, you know? Mm. <laughs> But we thought the wise or smart thing to do would be to at least wait a couple years. Yes. So we did. We barely but waited. We really wanted we just couldn't and wait. loved children. Yeah, we couldn't wait to have kids. So it was pretty early in our marriage where we had, you know, three kids in, in five years. We had a boy and then a girl and a boy and just loved being we parents love together. We married life. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and I just want to say this up front, that we all yeah. already love you and we're <laughs> for you, but I know we have to go through the sin and ashes to then oh discover my gosh, yes. the beauty that comes later. So mm-hmm. about 17 years into your marriage, what yeah. happened? 
all I could say is that I believe we had the best marriage imaginable. And this was not on the radar. We weren't arguing. We weren't fighting with each other. Life wasn't difficult. In fact, life was busy. Audrey and I were very, very busy doing really good things. An international children's television program, a national daily Christian TV. We were pastoring a church We were pastoring a church. And we just thought, what more could we do? Can you hear the busyness of Mm. three... entire careers all happening at the same time, plus raising our kids. So I remember years back when we had been in a service and I heard the words, beware of the barrenness of busyness. And it's a really silent, covert operation when you just start making choices to just keep helping people and just losing that connection. Even though you're getting along, we just were missing the connection. So you're in ministry, you've got children in the home right now, and at this point, their ages are teenagers? Yeah, they were like 10, 12, and 15 years old. Mm -hmm. And so let me just set the stage for what happened here, Laura, because it was on my part, we were busy, and I was just working really hard. And I remember just feeling that quiet desperation of feeling trapped in my life, that we were too committed to too many things. And I was starting to dread every new day because I was the happy one. I'm the fun one. So I've got to wake up and put that, I don't want to call it a mask because I I truly was happy, like as far as I'm a joyful person, but the exhaustion and the over-responsibility was just weighing on me. And I never felt like I could ever do enough to get everything done in the day. And I was starting to feel just literally exhausted. I was not telling him about this at all. I was. This was a very silent struggle that I was going through. Mm-hmm. And a young guy started coming to the church that we were pastoring. And he started just asking me, he just started noticing all the work I was doing. And you know what's really weird is it just felt good for somebody to notice He said, does anyone know like how much you do in a day? Like, does anyone see what you're doing? And I just went, wow. And what happened was I felt like my heart just got heard. Like somebody noticed that maybe it's not that easy or that I'm going through more than anyone might know. So he touched a place in my heart, which drew me into this friendship with him. And we were more like I was helping him. And it was just an, you know, one of those relationships where, oh, we're just friends. And I'm so glad that I can be friends with this guy because he's helping me. He's now he's starting to tell me how beautiful I am. And I thought, oh my gosh, that feels so good. We need to get you a girlfriend. But I was just, you know, happy for the attention and happy for the help. And so this just became a friendship. And that's where I can say that I made a small compromise. And that was just that I started having private email conversations with him. I started thinking, a little compromise, I can go out for lunch with him. And this is the part that is so sobering because there's no such thing as a small compromise. Because when you start to lean towards sin, sin will take you further Than you ever dreamed we'd go. It's never, sin is never satisfied. It kept wanting more, wanted that next conversation, wanted to get a little bit more private, maybe a little more intimate. And before long, that friendship lasted a while, but it did turn into a sexual affair. And that is something I never dreamed that I was even capable of because I love Jesus all my life. I love my husband. I love my kids. We're leaders. My passion is to bring people to Jesus. So now I'm carrying this intense Mm -hmm. secret. Mm -hmm. I cannot even describe to you the turmoil of living a dual life, like a duplicity of lying so that I can get out of the house. And all of a sudden I was on this crazy train and I was carrying the secret and I was emotionally like a junior high person. I knew that Everything that I was doing went against who I was. And after three weeks of having this sexual affair, we stopped the affair and he immediately moved away the next day. I said, you're going to have to leave town. And that was when I just made the decision. I will never do that again. I am going to repent. I am. No one ever needs to know about this because this will never happen again. Nobody knows and it'll never happen again. So there I was with my secret. I planned on keeping the secret, but it was only a couple days of me, you know, just really praying and, and asking God to forgive me. And I heard 
that still small voice in my heart saying, you need to tell Bob. And I resisted it. I fought it. I thought, no, 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 no. He doesn't have to know. I'll just be such a good girl. I'll just make up for this and be really good. But I knew, see, the enemy loves secrets. And the secret has a power to divide intimacy. Even if it's an unspoken secret, it has power. And a couple days after that guy left town, I'm not a confrontational person. I hadn't confronted Bob in 17 years about anything. I'm a people pleaser. This is completely against me, but everything in me just fell at his feet and said, honey, we need to talk. And I still remember exactly where you are. When you have a moment like this in your life, you do not forget where you are. I remember the office, the empty office. I remember the chair in the corner. And I just fell at Bob's feet and I said, honey, I've got to tell you something. I had an affair. I committed adultery. Mm -hmm. Wow. And such a tender moment in the office. So, Bob, at that point, when you first heard the news, how did you respond? Not well. (laughs) Yeah, I could say that. It was like a, a real surprise because I know her. And this is completely incongruent with who she is and who we are you know, as a couple and and as a family. And so I began to ask questions. I began to interrogate. I found out who it was when, you know, it just began to compile and I just became angry. But the only thought that I had in my mind was, I don't have an answer, but I don't want this to ever happen again. So it's not just like a little oops or a hiccup in the relationship and, you know, okay, I forgive you. Let's move on. And it was like, how do I express anger? You know, how do I really show I'm really disappointed? I I, honestly, I was clueless of what to do. And I remember storming out of the room and and I sat at my office desk and I stared at a blank wall and I just simply whispered, Holy Spirit, I don't know what to do. But it was that such small act of humility, and he immediately answered me, and he began a rescue plan for me. He began a rescue plan for my marriage, you know, for our family. And he reminded me of a gentleman that I had met about a year earlier, and he said, call him. I called him. I let him know what I was going through. And the first question that he asked me was, who knows? I said, nobody. He says, good, let's keep it that way. And I was like, but I I need to get more people involved. I mean, this is a big deal. I mean, we need to create at least a committee to figure out how are we going to fix this? And he said, Bob, he says, don't you tell anyone until we have more time to talk later this evening. Well, that evening we got together and we, you know, sat and we spoke over a speakerphone And he began to challenge me, which I was so surprised because I was just waiting for him to begin to correct. And, you know, Audrey, how could you have done this? You are so wrong. What were you thinking? None of that happened. And he began to challenge me. And I was I was really surprised because he began to challenge me with the heart of God. Proverbs 25, 2 says this. It's God's glory to conceal a matter and for a king to discover its understanding. Everything inside of me wanted to expose and wanted to shame. Everything inside of me wanted to control. It was being driven by fear. And he's challenging me with the heart of a father, with the heart of God. And he says, that's not his nature. He is one who covers. Now, it's not that he turns a blind eye. It's not that he ignores, but rather he covers. And in covering, there are two primary principles. The first one is to protect from any further injury or harm. And then the second one is to promote healing. When we've been cut or wounded, we go immediately and we cover that wound. We protect that wound. Everything inside of me wanted to expose and to shame Audrey. There was so much fear inside of me. And and I just wanted to, you know, force my will. But that's not the heart of God. God covers and he covers me. And so I'm being challenged that very first night. Bob, will you cover your wife? Rather than exposing her, rather than shaming her, 
would you sense the love of God hmm. and would you love her and would you cover her? You, you see, I think so often when these kinds of things happen, we blow them up and we just really prolong the healing process. And it's just like, what is the heart of God? So, I mean, I was being really challenged. And all that I knew is that I was out of my mind and this man knows something that I don't. So I had to trust him. I had to believe him. And so that that began. And then the next day, Audrey told her parents, we were living in Winnipeg. We went to Phoenix for about a week. We got you know some help there. And it was almost as though, okay, we're on a path of recovery. Mm -hmm. I can hear the tenderness as you both share uh, this uh, and just God's grace is yeah. so it evident. Is you know God's what, Laura? Grace. And and I want to underscore that. And a lot of people can in, misinterpret it and think, oh man, he, that, that dude's still hurting over this. Yeah. Well, you know, it hurts. But when I go back and I remember moments like this, I become tender and I can feel the emotion because it was in my deepest hurt, in my deepest pain, where I have been the most loved. And when I sense and feel and I know that love, it's wow. You see, it's love that really does conquer mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. It's it's those times of pain yeah. where you just experience Jesus like oh, you never even dreamed. That love is so real. It's so real. And you, when you need him, he's there. Everyone who's been in a lot of pain knows what it feels like mm -hmm. when you go to bed and he's the la Jesus is the last thing before you where you close off and when you first wake up, you need him so much. Yeah, so we got through those first couple weeks. Yeah. I can't say it was easy. It was so painful. The continual interrogation, you know, mm -hmm. just needing details, uh, yeah, of course, of what I did. And every time I'd answer a question, I would just feel ripped from the inside of me of that I have to say out loud, you know, what I had done. And after about two weeks, we were okay, like considering what was happening. And that's when we found out, we went to a doctor's office and we found out that I had become pregnant as a result of the affair. And I remember walking to that doctor's office and I thought, when I told Bob about this affair, I didn't think I could face my future. But now that I was pregnant, I didn't think I could face my life. I didn't see any form or idea of hope because this baby would not look like the other kids. The other kids are like 10, 12, and 15 years old. And the enemy just screamed in my head, you're going to be known for the rest of your life for this most stupid and selfish thing that you've ever done. And your kids are going to have to pay. Their lives are going to be broken and tainted and confused. I love my kids so much. And the thought of them having to pay for my selfishness in some way in their lives, like, it's just such a contradiction because I just want to protect my kids from pain. And here this is going to be like a forever stain on our family. And I didn't know what to do. Like to say I was scared is an understatement. I was scared out of my mind. As I said, the baby won't look like the others. It's going to be obvious to everyone. I'm disqualified from everything I felt like I was born to do, which was to love people and tell people about Jesus. And so like a couple of days after I found that out, I was alone in the kitchen and I was in torment and I made a phone call and I called the abortion clinic and I said, what do I do if I have to remain anonymous? What do I do? And they said, oh, it's really easy. You just have to give us your address and we'll send you 10 pills in the mail and you just take one every week for 10 weeks and your problem will be gone. And I hung up the phone. And I fell to my knees and I just said, Father, I said, you're my dad. You're my dad in heaven. And I said, please, please, I know I can't get an abortion because two wrongs do not make a right. I, everything in me is saying, I can't destroy this baby. But Father, if you love me, if you love me, I've wanted to serve you all my conscious years since I was three years old. I just want to serve you. But if you could just please, please, I'm begging you, take this baby to heaven now. Just, I begged him for a miscarriage. 
So just take this baby to heaven. And as I say that, it's so emotional for me because I'm sitting here today just saying he did not answer that prayer. You know how we have these great ideas of how God could fix everything. But he says, you know what? I'm not going to evacuate you out of your circumstances. But Audrey, I'm going to come right to where you are and I'm going to hold you. And together we are going to take it one day at a time and we are going to walk through. And you know, the famous Psalm says, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you fear no evil for I'm with you and my rod and my staff, they comfort you. And just that word comfort, because every day he comforts us. And we're, and when we're in pain and fear, so scared that we can't make it through, his presence becomes so real and his hope becomes your anchor that that's the only thing that you can hope for. So I didn't follow through with that. And it was a couple of days later, I was alone in the car with my dad. And I have a very, very merciful, loving, earthly dad. And I was alone in the car with him and, and I felt so safe with him because he wasn't judging me. And I said, Dad, I don't know what to do because there's a baby. I don't know how to face my life because there's a baby. And he put his hand on my shoulder and he just said one thing. He said, Audrey, that's what you did, but that is not who you are. And those words came over me and I chose to make those the forefront of my every day, all day. That is what I did, but that is not who I am. People in this world and on this earth will judge you by your worst mistake. But my heavenly father calls me his own. He calls me his daughter. And he says that he's never going to leave me. He's never going to turn his back on me, but he's going to be with me. And what I admire about both of you is that in these times of distress, you turn toward the Lord, you called out for him, and he answered with loving kindness, as he always does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So true, Laura. Mm -hmm. Let's take a quick break to hear a message from our sponsor. I'm so excited to share today's sponsor, Windshape Marriage, with you. Windshape Marriage is a fantastic ministry that helps couples prepare, strengthen, and if needed, even save their marriage. Windshape Marriage is grounded on the belief that the strongest marriages are the ones that are nurtured, even if it seems like things are going smoothly. That way, they'll be stronger if they do hit a bump along their marital journey. Through their weekend retreats, Windshape Marriage invites couples to enjoy time away to simply focus on each other. These weekend retreats are hosted within the beautiful refuge of Windshape Retreat, perched in the mountains of Rome, Georgia, which is just a short drive from Atlanta, Birmingham, and Chattanooga. While you and your spouse are there, you'll be well fed well-nurtured, and well-cared for. During your time away in this beautiful place, you and your spouse will learn from expert speakers and explore topics related to intimacy, overcoming challenges, improving communication, and so much more. I've stayed on site at Windshape before, and I can attest to their generosity, food, and content. You will be so grateful you went. To find an experience that's right for you and your spouse, head to their website, winshapemarriage.org. That's W-I-N-S-H-A-P-E marriage.org. Thanks for your sponsorship. And so at this point, how did you choose together to tell your children the news? Yeah, we resigned all of our positions, you know, living there in Canada, and we moved to Phoenix, Arizona. I'm a born American citizen. And so we were able to do that. But it wasn't that we were running from anything, but rather we were going to a place we needed help. And I knew that in and of myself, I didn't have it. And so I needed direction. And I didn't want, you know, as Audrey said earlier, I don't want to mess up my family. You see, in my life, I know the pains of divorce as a young person, you know, with my parents walking through it. And it's just like, I don't want my kids to experience this. And so, God, I need you to be real. You know, and, and that's what you're you know, saying, Laura. You know, we turn to him. But then all of a sudden, everything that you know about or believe about God, I need it to be real. 
I need it to be for me. That was where I was going because everything that I had learned, everything that I had ever read, anything that I had ever preached, I needed it to be my reality. And so I just began to press hard, recognizing how deficient I was, but he he is my source. And so it was about, Audrey is about four months pregnant, and it was just after dinner one evening, and I'm going through the process, and I'm being challenged again in my heart by my pastor, you know, you can cover Audrey. And so I'm learning this covering, and it's not just how I cover her, but you can't give what you first don't experience. And I'm going through the process of experiencing the extravagance of the Father's love, and he's covering me. You see, he's more than enough for me. And when that becomes mine, now I can give it away. And so she's four months pregnant. We we have, you know, a typical classic Meisner family meeting up in the bedroom. And the kids walk in and they enter the room and they see their mom and dad sitting on the floor crying. I remember my 15 year old son and just Fear gripped his heart, and you could see it on his face. It's just like, uh oh, something's really wrong. My daughter, 13, she comes in, and my son, 10 years old, he comes in, and here we are, a family of five, and everything's about to change. But before I said one word, I stood up and I went and I pulled a large queen size blanket from the bed, and I took that blanket. And I covered Audrey from head to foot. And then I knelt down beside her and I wrapped my arms around her and I held her tight. And I looked deep into my children's eyes and I said, kids, this is what God does when we make a mistake. He comes to us and he covers us. He wraps his arms around us and he begins to whisper, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. With Audrey covered and held in my arms, I looked deep in my children's eyes and I said, kids, we're a family. I'm not going anywhere. We belong with each other. And with Audrey fully covered, I said, kids, your mom has made a mistake. But you're going to have a baby brother. Well, immediately, my oldest son, he's crying. He understood what had happened. My daughter, she's crying, but it only took her but a moment. And she begins to grin from ear to ear and she stares me down and she says, Daddy, we're having a baby. And she feels my pain and starts to cry, but she cannot contain the excitement. And she just looks at me eye to eye. Daddy, we're having a baby. My 10 year old son, David, he's watching all of this and he says, I just don't get it. He says, at least I'm not going to be the youngest anymore. And that's how we told our kids. And we went from that room as a family. We're a family and we belong, you know, with each other. And we had, again, good days. It wasn't always easy. It was, oh gosh, it was not always easy. Like absolutely one of the most challenging days of our life where the God, God was meeting us in those days. Yeah. Audrey would grow and, and get larger. Mm-hmm. And my daughter is just loving this baby, right. you know, rubbing mommy's tummy, talking yeah. to the baby, you know, <laughs> we and so then scared. she would look at me as like, is this okay, dad? And I'm like, yes, sweetheart, you love that baby with everything that you've got. Yeah. And so it was, it was very, very challenging, you know, for me. And there was just such an immaturity and, you know, that I, I needed to grow up up. And I had no idea, you know, the depth of that in my own life. Wow. And now how has life changed for both of you since that moment? I'd I'd like to kind of, you know, share with the people how uh, this baby was born. I mean, (laughs) that's a pretty cool day. But uh, I'll back it up just a little bit. Because I kept asking my pastor, my friend, to help me, you know, just tell me what to do. And he continually refused because it's just like, I got to get to God's throne room myself. 
I don't need him to be my answer. I need God to be my answer. I need him to be my source. But this one morning, we're having just a quick coffee together. And I'm like, what do I do? Because I had a real national presence. So I had people calling me saying, Bob and Audrey, you're doing so good, but you can't keep this baby. You know, don't bring that added pressure to your marriage. Don't don't bring that, you know, to your children. We have people in the church. You can adopt this baby out. And so that morning I was with him and I'm just like, Leo, what do I do? What do I do? Finally, it was almost as though he had enough of me. And he says, Bob. There's a baby on your doorstep. What do you do? Will you participate with this fatherless generation or will you become a father to the fatherless? You've got to grow up. (laughs) Probably one of the most loving things (laughs) I ever experienced. So we went to the hospital and it was probably just a few months later. And I I choose my words very carefully. When my son was born, when our son was born, I gave him my name, Robert, because I don't want him to ever question a day in his life whose boy he is. He's my son and he belongs. His middle name is Theodore, which means divine gift. Because he's not an accident, he's not a mistake, he's not the result of a sexual affair, but just like my other three children, born out of the heart of God and entrusted to us, we're a family. Yeah. Wow, that is incredible. Thank you so much, both of you, just bringing us into that to see what that experience was like. And you've mentioned God throughout the entire process, but he had even more in store for the two of you. And Audrey, Satan was whispering to you that this would ruin your plans forever and you couldn't do ministry. And yet he's used this. So can you share what has come since that point in both of your lives? And it was a process, you know, we can't shortcut a healing process And we never dreamed in a million years that we would ever start sharing our story. Mm -hmm. The process of healing changed. And and once Robert was born, there was a shift in our home where it was just sort of like this closure, like this new reality, new normal. Because what was concealed is now revealed. Yeah. Here he is. Yeah. And and, (laughs) And and so as a family, we just began to grow with each other. And and, And uh, it was just amazing to me how the kids mm, to this day. Oh, my have embraced Robert like there is there is no difference no. other than he's a lot younger and maybe a little bit darker but I mean my goodness like we are they a family are with sister. four kids yeah. yes but how this is what happened is a couple years later we were asked to share this story and I was like whoa like I don't want like that was that was terrifying that was terrifying for and sure I do want to say this after a couple years it was almost as though we were right back into ministry Mm -hmm. We were right back to where we were previous. Mm -hmm. And yet it was like, this isn't what we want. And it's almost as though we're back into this tandem lifestyle again. And it's like we are missing the benefit of our union of oneness. And so there's a place where you kind of modify behavior, you weather the storm, but we started to slip. Bob is saying we we started to slip back in the same rut of being yeah, busy that routine, and getting that into that again. right. Yeah. But then something in us we just knew wasn't okay. And I went through an experience where after two years, Bob was really in a depression because I think he could just feel that we haven't we haven't really dealt with this in a way. And I'm trying to be okay. He's you trying see, to be okay. I'm managing my anger. You see, I'm managing my the images and the the thoughts that I have. Right. But again, it was challenging. It was. And I remember I remember one day when I just had done everything I could to fix him and be better and be perform and be the most amazing wife ever. But I remember when when God whispered into my heart and he said, you know what, Audrey, changing Bob isn't your job. The most irresistible thing that you can do for your husband is stop trying to change him or fix him or or heal him or make him better. And I, there was a day I remember when I just released Bob and said, God, I trust you with him. And something transformed in my heart. And it was just a couple of years later when we went through a very deep moment 
where I saw myself as Jesus saw me, so righteous and clean. I don't have to prove myself anymore. And then later that same weekend, Bob had a moment where he absolutely chose to rescue me rather than judge me. And those experiences turned into something very transformational in our hearts. And now we started to feel the strength of the story rather than the fear of our story or the sadness in our story. We started to feel God restoring us and redeeming this. And there became this presence of God that would come. And when we first told our story, marriages started to say, wow, if you can do that, then we can work through our stuff. And we began growing in our understanding of what were the contributing factors were that brought us to that point. We started dealing with unresolved conflict that had been there right from the very beginning that we didn't have the skills to navigate. And it turned into writing books and a marriage ministry and you know our children growing up together and and seeing true just there's no performance or fakiness in the life that we have where our kids yeah we're not perfect but there's just this atmosphere of love and our house we've actually named our house the house of mercy where we don't want our kids running away from home when they mess up we want our kids running to home because this is our house of mercy and we do real life together Amen to all of that, especially that none of us are perfect. Hey friends, we appreciate you so much. Over 100 of you have left a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts, and you have no idea how much that helps the Savvy Sauce Podcast. Basically, the more ratings and reviews we have, the more Apple Podcasts shares our podcast to help others easily discover it. Also, when we gain more listeners... High quality guests are more likely to agree to come on for future interviews, and sponsors are willing to fund our work. So we can continue sharing this practical and biblical teaching through these conversations. You are a critical part of this process, so thank you for generously giving your time to give us a five star rating and review. We certainly can all learn from our own and even others mistakes. And so Mm -hmm. what do you think is the biggest lesson that God taught each of you about your part in your marriage not going the way you had originally envisioned? Well, you asked both of us, so I'll go first. And basically, one of the biggest lessons I learned was that I had never understood or had the skill to navigate disappointment. Early on in our marriage, I had felt disappointed with Bob, but I never learned how to voice that, how to express it, how to be honest about it. And so when I would try to voice a disappointment, it would turn into a conflict where I would feel attacked and I would shut down. And that became a pattern in our life where disappointment turned into unresolved conflict, which turned into despair. And it resulted in not having an honest and real relationship in a deep kind of a way. And I can see now that that affected us right from the, me right from the beginning. Mm, yeah. Uh, there are, you know, definitely foundational things that are in there. And boy, what a question, Laura. Just one? Are you kidding me? Yeah. What is the biggest lesson? <laughs> I just gave you a big lesson. There's like a million of them. I just chose one. You know what I mean? You know, when people begin to get help, you know, or they, they're recognizing they're having a breakdown in their relationship, usually it goes to a place of communication. Mm-hmm. And so for us, I felt like we communicated, but we really didn't. And what we found is that, you know, typically in psychology, you have the passive, the aggressive, passive, aggressive, and the assertive. I throw in a fifth one. And that fifth one is the Jesus model. Yeah, and I Jesus, love the Jesus teaches model. in communication to yes. speak the truth in love. Yes. And what we found in our relationship is mm-hmm. that I had no problem speaking truth. Came natural to you. But <laughs> bringing it in a loving way, wow, did that ever have to change? And then for Audrey. Yeah, for me, I was really going to be loving and sweet and nice and kind, but I just held back truth of how I was really feeling or truth about how I was, you know, in the deepest part of me, I just hid that and thought, oh, I can just choose what I'll tell Bob. If it's going to cause a conflict, then I'll just not say it. So I was really good at speaking love, 100% love, but my truth 
wasn't as strong. And I have realized since then, Bob feels most loved when I'm truthful. Mm -hmm. So that was one of them. And then yeah, the there's other a million of them is that I wanted to blame her and the circumstances. And I wanted that to give me permission to be angry, to be distant, to withhold, to be unloving. Why? Because it's your fault. You see, and then we shift blame. And you know, you might think, well, yeah, of course. And it's like, no, I can't change anyone, mm -hmm. but I can take personal responsibility for me. And so I had to learn what is it to be a husband, to be a father. I, I am so thankful that I'm not the person I used to be. And just how, me too. how I mean, you're about me. no, I meant about me. I meant about me, Bob. I did not mean that yeah, about you. Yeah. I mean, but I am, to be honest, I am glad you're not the God person you used to be. No, 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 no. Yeah. I'm glad that I'm not the person I used to be, too. <laughs> <laughs> but we're both on it. And I have yeah. to admit, I am glad you're not the person you used yeah. to be because yeah. you're much nicer now. You're Thank a lot you. kinder. Okay. Yeah, we've both taken serious <laughs> personal responsibility for how we have over in our personality and in our behavior styles, we are when you overuse your strengths, they become your weakness. You know, one of the things people look for is why. You know, yeah. you, you you drill it into the other person. Why did you do this? Why did you say that? Why? And it's always linked to a judgment. Mm -hmm. And what you want to do is you want to hang blame somewhere. And there isn't one logical explanation that would right. ever make it okay. Would you make it feel better? Yeah. It's never going to feel okay. No, no and it, it was happened. wrong. Yes. It never should have happened, but it did. Yeah. So where do we go to from here? Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you just resisted that victim mentality and chose the remedy, <laughs> like you're saying, of just... I, I was a good victim, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> I was. Because... It's easy because then people would come and say to me, hey, Bob, why are you so sad? You know, why do I, you know, sense this sadness about you? And it's just like, oh, here, you don't know my story. Let me tell you my story. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden they're just like, oh, I get it. Yeah. You see, and, and I always relate that to blind Bartimaeus where he goes to Jesus. But before he goes to meet him, it says that he removed his garment and he went to Jesus and Jesus asked him this question. He says, you know, Bartimaeus, what do you want? He says, I want to see. And better phrased this way, what are you willing for me to do for you? And Bartimaeus, you know, it's like, Lord, I want to, re I want to regain sight. But him removing his garments, very important because that garment that he wore, identified him as a legitimate blind man worthy of receiving alms. You see, I could have worn a garment the rest of my life and I could say, yeah, I'm this way because of, and now I live, you know, circumstantially, you know, because of this. And then I blame and on and on, but it was just like, I'm going to leave that garment behind. Jesus opened my eyes. I need your perspective. I, I don't see right. I'm blind. I'm angry. Hmm. You see, I'm I'm resentful. Jesus, I need to see what you see. Hmm. And that was a huge transformational, you know, journey for me. Wow. And on this unexpected journey, is there anything else that either of you have discovered that you'd like to share with either a single or a married couple that's listening right now? Yeah, probably that your spouse, like no one's responsible to make you happy. No one can be your source but Jesus. For me, when I was in that place of quiet desperation, I needed Jesus, but I needed to get honest with him to create a space where you really experience Jesus. You don't just know about him and you don't just pray to him using nice language, but you actually, you know, experience his love and you can go to your secret place. But as you're there in that place, as you close your eyes, just say, Jesus, I need you and you are my source. And then I, whenever I try and expect Bob to be my source for anything, it can result in disappointment. It's never fair to see someone as your source. Bob is my number one contributor, but he is not my source. So for a single person, you know what? You need Jesus is your source for absolutely everything. As a married person, he's your source. That's how we're protected from becoming users in relationships. We want to love 
because we are so loved. You know, like experience God's love so that you can love others. Yeah. Something I'd like to bring out is that in fear, fear will always create worst case scenario. Right. And and fear will always control. So you'll either be controlling to others or mm-hmm. it'll want to, that, that emotion will want to, you know, drive your life. I remember when I had the first thought and it was like my first panic attack. The first time I had ever had the thought, what do I do if she's pregnant? And I remember where I was walking with Audrey and, and my my pastor, and I'm like, I'm going to drop this bombshell of a question. I mean, it's going to stump him because I don't know what to do. So I asked him, and I just said, Leo, what do I do if she's pregnant? Because for me, I'm thinking this is a game changer. There is no marriage after this. But before I could even finish asking the question, he immediately responded, Bob, his grace will be more than enough for you. I tell you, Laura, I remember it was I clenched my fist and it's just like, dude, I'll take you out right now. (laughs) No, really. I was just like, don't give me this religious cliche. This is my life that we're talking about. I mean, this is the inner war that happens in nanoseconds. Mm-hmm. But immediately the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, Bob, this man knows something about my nature and character you know nothing about. My grace is more than enough for you. And that began my journey to his throne room. You see, for his enablement, his empowerment for my life, for his realities to become mine. And that that began my journey because I, I recognized how deficient I was in love. And he is love. That is just incredible to hear you both even just sum it up that way. And clearly you are such a wise and encouraging couple. Oh, I love it. So that is our heart. Like we sure want it to love people. I, that's for sure. I know there's people that listen. Yeah. And and it's not that your marriage has to be on the rocks, you know, for this to be applicable. But yeah. you get to know the God who, who designed you, yeah. who has dreamed you up. And no matter where you are, I can say with absolute confidence in Jesus, your best days really are ahead of you. And your Redeemer lives. Because I didn't think there oh, was a redemption yeah. to this story. But, you know, I, I think of the people who have had an abortion that are listening. And it hurts, you know. I think of the people who have had a divorce that are and listening. And saying, we didn't know this when I got a divorce. And I didn't know what kind of painful road I was, you know, going to go on and stuff. And I just want to say to those people, you know, whatever has happened, those, yes, those are the facts of life. But even you get to draw a line mm. in the sand today. And just choose and decide to to shout it from the housetops that your Redeemer yes, lives. Does. Like I yes. speak it right to your heart. Mm. Your Redeemer lives, you guys. I know you don't see the happy ending to the story, but there's not. And maybe your story didn't end like ours, but there is redemption and there is there is future. There is hope. Just because Jesus is so creative, he can innovate a new plan and a new idea for your life that you could never have imagined. Yes, and amen. And where can listeners go to gain even more encouragement from both of you? Well, we we, our website is lovemarriedlife.com, lovemarriedlife.com. And I love that we have some free ebooks there because they're kind of our some of our favorite subjects, like my personality goals talks about how in our personal behavior, Bob and I are so different. Like Bob loves to do things right, and I love to do things fast. So we're very different in our approach to everything. But yet when we got married, we thought we were identical. Yeah, right. And so we've really developed in the free ebook called My Personality Goals. We have developed just helping people understand that when you overuse your strength, that's when they become, you know, your blind spots. But when you can understand your spouse, it just brings a lot of help. So my personality goals, that's for singles or married. And my communication goals, those two free ebooks, I encourage people to download yeah. those. And then listen to our podcast called All About Relationships. And also a lot of couples come for deep, intense, where they come to our house in Phoenix for three days and we do an intensive. They stay at a hotel, but we spend eight hours a day and we do a three-day intensive with couples. And this has been my favorite part of ministry Mm. because we see couples, they might be some couples just to come to learn how to minister to others, but in three days to invest eight hours a day to get to the deep rooted 
destructive cycles that keep you going around and around and around the same laps, we get to help you break those. And that's probably one of my favorite things about what we do. Well, and I always like to remind listeners, if this is your first time with us, we will always link to all of these resources. Oh, thank you, Laura. Yes, I want to make it very easy for you to find Bob and Audrey. And you know that we're called the Savvy Sauce. (laughs) Yay! I love it. So savvy is synonymous with practical knowledge or discernment. And so as my final question for each of you today, what is your Savvy Sauce? Oh, I love this question. And I think our savvy sauce together is that we are so different and we refuse to see each other as our problem, but I see Bob as my gift. And then we can sing a song together when we are in harmony. Mm, Yeah. Behavioral modification, it will only take you so far. We really work towards a heart transformation because it's from the heart that emerges all the boundaries of our life. In other words, Every sense of limitation that we experience, it really does flow from the heart. And we can spend an entire lifetime focusing on the problems or the limitations that we perceive that are, you know, outside of our influence. But in reality, these limitations are based on what I believe about myself in my heart to be true, whether that be good or bad. And so Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart above all else. And so I want to live transformed. It's a great feeling to live clean, you know, tailor your behavior. You know, boy, am I ever being good. It gets to be exhausting. When people oftentimes read a book, attend a marriage seminar, it's like they walk away with another 10 things to do, another list It only works as long as you're working the list. I want to live free. Different. Is that your savvy sauce, Bob? Different than living clean. I want to live live free. free. And that's where we experience effortless victory through a transformed heart. Because life becomes easy and fun. We believe that marriage is fun. Yeah, fun. (laughs) There's our savvy sauce. Some people think it's hard. No, no, it's intentional. I get that. Yeah. But boy, it is fun. So in a word, our savvy sauce is marriage is fun. Okay. (laughs) Oh, that's so good. Well, Bob and Audrey, your story just does not cease to amaze me because it does point to a loving and patient and gracious Heavenly Father who Mm -hmm. is in the ministry of reconciliation. So thank you for sharing your story with all of us today. Thank Thank you for, for, for just finding us and for loving us and inviting us. We feel really loved by you. Thank Mm -hmm. you, Laura. Thank you. We thank you for all your amazing listeners. One more thing before you go. Have you heard the term gospel before? It simply means good news. And I want to share the best news with you, but it starts with the bad news. Every single one of us were born sinners and God is perfect and holy. So he cannot be in the presence of sin. Therefore, we're separated from him. This means there's absolutely no chance we can make it to heaven on our own. So for you and for me, it means we deserve death and we can never pay back the sacrifice we owe to be saved. We need a savior. But God loved us so much, he made a way for his only son to willingly die in our place as the perfect substitute. This gives us hope of life forever in right relationship with him. That is good news. Jesus lived the perfect life we could never live and died in our place for our sin. This was God's plan to make a way to reconcile with us so that God can look at us and see Jesus. We can be covered and justified through the work Jesus finished if we choose to receive what he has done for us. Romans 10 9 says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So would you pray with me now? Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to take our place. I pray someone today, right now, is touched and chooses to turn their life over to you. Will you clearly guide them and help them take their next step in faith to declare you as Lord of their life? We trust you to work and change the lives now for eternity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
If you prayed that prayer, you are declaring him for me, so me for him. You get the opportunity to live your life for him. At this podcast, we are called Savvy for a reason. We want to give you practical tools to implement the knowledge you have learned. So you're ready to get started? First, tell someone. Say it out loud. Get a Bible. The first day I made this decision, my parents took me to Barnes & Noble to get the Quest NIV Bible, and I love it. Start by reading the book of John. Get connected locally, which basically means just tell someone who is part of the church in your community that you made a decision to follow Christ. I'm assuming they will be thrilled to talk with you about further steps, such as going to church and getting connected to other believers to encourage you. We want to celebrate with you too, so feel free to leave a comment for us if you made a decision for Christ. We also have show notes included where you can read scripture that describes this process. Finally, be encouraged. Luke 15.10 says, In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The heavens are praising with you for your decision today. If you've already received this good news, I pray that you have someone else to share it with today. You are loved, and I look forward to meeting you here next time.